بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم السلام علیکم جی آیا نو پخیر آغلے نی ہاو چونشم میں وشملے او ہائی گنزائمز گوٹر موگن اولا بو یو پریویت کیفہ حال حال شما چطورے اہلا و سال مرحبا بونا موچو گراسیا سوابیا بھلی کرے آیا ہوش گیال دن ان آئے اسائے او خویا مورا چی وطو چی حال جہود کالی میرا and a very warm welcome to everybody who's tuned in to PTV World and are watching World this morning alongside my very well learned colleague who happens to be Ms. Hajar Sati. I happen to be Shazad Asan Khan and we hope and pray that everybody out there is doing wonderfully well and that you're ready to kickstart your day with us. But first things first, hello Hajar, Assalamu Alaikum, how are you feeling today? Wa Alaikum Assalam, thank you so much for introducing me Shazad, Jazakallah Khair. Uh, very good morning to you and everyone out there but since we have gathered here for a very special occasion and we would like to uh, I mean, talk upon a subject that is very close to our heart and it has always been very close and it has been so long um, since that topic or since that issue has not been resolved, which mm. is the Kashmir issue of Indian illegally occupied Jammu and Kashmir. And uh, Shazada, before we proceed, we would like to introduce some of the facts to our audiences true, out there, uh, which is about how India has changed the demographic status of Indian illegally occupied Jammu and Kashmir. They are promoting the very militarized tourism there, despite the fact that uh, Indian illegally occupied Jammu and Kashmir is predominantly a Muslim territory. There are lots of mosques there. Um, there are lots of li uh, religious symbols uh, there, but they are changing that into Hindutva styled symbolism there. For example, um, they are promoting a lot of yatras there for this god and that god and uh, making sure that there is a entirely um, garrisons and camps that are propped up there with an Indian army posted there. And there are so many Indian soldiers that are posted there. Um, that has been militarized that region and it is one of the heavily militarized region. So 50,000 uh, plus temples are being constructed there. They have been constructed. They're also trying to convert the paddy areas, the paddy land, the water bodies into um, the, com uh, what do you call it, the cantonments. And obviously this is not just a violation of the or elimination of the Kashmiri identity from there, but it is also, uh, I would like to say, an environment terrorism because they're changing the environment there, right? Um, um, and obviously these violations have been taking place and, and, and Haja, in addition to that I believe that you know I would like to add over here that we we need to remember uh, that you know that our brethren within the Indian illegally occupied Jammu and Kashmir has been um, under siege for last four years yes and and we have seen that you know that the Moody instilled Hindu fascist regime still exist over there in the Indian illegally occupied Jammu and Kashmir and if it's not just that we have seen how India has actually used uh, mass rape you know as a war weapon and that's something that we certainly need to talk about because it's not just a human rights violation I think right. you know for Kashmiris to never be able to get that right to self-determination is something that we really need to kind of talk about and Pakistan and Pakistanis actually have are the beacon of hope for the people of Indian illegally occupied Jammu and Kashmir and with all of that demographic change that right. you've actually spoken about you know so it certainly mm -hmm. looks like that if there is going to be a day that a plebiscite is going to take place I think right. all of these uh, are because of uh, you know True. that uh, you know they, in they're order preparing to it and I think rigging that territory uh, and making sure that uh, Muslim status is reduced Muslim majority status is reduced to Muslim minority status uh, and all the Hindus then vote in the favor of India and then they can very cleverly tell the world that yes uh, the plebiscite has taken place and people have voted in the favor of India and obviously we would like to highlight all of these discrepancies that India is going through and uh, to uh, add further momentum to our conversation and to put out few statistics so 8,000 disappearances have been reported in the past 28 years and no one has dared challenge them in the court of law that means there is no court of law in the first place True. right and they have very funny laws they have erected there they can pick up anyone from the territory without any proper proceedings or, or without any proper charges uh, giving them a without a, a, I would say the free trial right uh, which is a basic right of a people who are living in a very dignified world in the global community and what What's more is that how India is trying to whitewash this entire process by saying that they are the member of the G20 um, and they are very responsible global power. It does not happen anywhere in a westernized democracies that you pick up people, you kill them, you maim them. Uh, we've seen back in 2010 how Shazad, uh, India has used pellet guns on true, Kashmiri true. people, right? And India think that it is their right 
to maim people out there to control their population there the bodies there but we have seen how people have been resisting there and that is a very indigenous resistance that is coming on and uh, not just the men they are resisting women are coming out kids are coming out girls are coming out uh, older people are coming out and they are resisting it in every form uh, for and, example and, and haja in addition to that you know we really need to mention over here that you know even on 14th of august we have seen that you know how Fire pakistani us. flags are being hoisted over right. there and not just that hmm. i think what we really need to consider over here that the plight of the indian illegally occupied jammu kashmir hmm. unfortunately what we have seen is the kashmiris which live over there within the indian illegally occupied jammu and kashmir unfortunately imagine that the reference point is that we do know that how yasin malik has been given a life sentence not just that right. you know he's not been able to uh, meet his wife or or his daughter True. and in addition to that you know imagine that it's it is a condition with so many people over there that you know that if one of those political figures we see you know the huriyat leaders ladies and gentlemen imagine how unfortunate and in addition to this i still remember that i have a friend who actually now works in the united kingdom and when the siege took place his father actually sent him all sorts of amount and assets and whatever he could transfer to his son right. and told him that never to come back over here again so imagine True. and when we talk about you know a siege day mm -hmm. imagine a life without internet imagine a life without rights imagine a life without education imagine you know how women unfortunately are being raped every single day and if you want a reference point for that i can give you that too as well because back in 1991 i think it was 23rd of february where a, a gang rape took place you know and that too you know the occupation forces actually raped more than 100 women in one instance and that's okay. something that the world really needs to come together this violation of human rights cannot continue and we keep on praying to allah almighty yes. that there needs to be a day and and we have a prayer to share right at the beginning of the program please go ahead let's do a prayer together let's make a prayer together Obviously, like she has alluded to before, this is uh, how Pakistani state always have championed the cause of Kashmiri brethren who have been living there, and we are the ambassadors of the Kashmiri people, uh, and we'll make sure that we'll continue advocating for their cause. And uh, in this uh, regard, in this momentum, our Prime Minister, caretaker Prime Minister, and Malur Haq Kakar Saab also addressed the United Nations Assembly, and he spoke about how. Uh, that we need to protect the rights of Kashmiri people because obviously human rights are the 
basic right of the people and everyone should be granted them. So let's listen to him. And this is exactly how, ladies and gentlemen, that Pakistan is making sure that they're going to champion the cause of the people of the Indian illegally occupied Jammu and Kashmir. And, you know, since we have spoken so much, we have given away the facts and figures, I think, on this occasion, it is very pertinent to kind of introduce this very worthy guest over here inside the studios, who unfortunately, when I mentioned that, imagine that, you know, if a daughter is not allowed to meet her father, you know, if a wife is not allowed to meet her husband and that too when the husband is under a life sentence in a jail. And that, that too, all the doled up charges, I mean there is no uh, power or strength to all of those charges. Those are all just fake charges and uh, I think his only uh, sentiment was to protect the pr dignity of his people and I think in a civilized world everyone should be granted their right, right Shazad? Exactly, so ladies and gentlemen without any further ado, we are very lucky that we have actually been joined by the Special Assistant to Prime Minister on Human Rights and Women Empowerment wife of jail Kashmiri Hurriyat leader Muhammad Yaseen Malik and obviously the mother to Razia Sultana, the daughter of jail Kashmiri Hurriyat leader Muhammad Yaseen Malik and she happens to be Ms. Mishal Hassan Malik. Assalamu alaikum. How are you? Thank you so much for joining us. Ji, wa alaikum salam. Thank you for inviting me. It's an honor to have you over here first of all because uh, to be very honest, I believe that you know that wherever you go you actually are the flag bearer for the people of Indian illegally occupied Jammu and Kashmir right. where they certainly are fighting every single day for their right to self-determination. First of all, you know, when we are to speak about it, we do see that, you know, how Prime Minister himself, the Prime Minister of the Islamic Republic of Pakistan, uh, out there on the uh, General Assembly session has mentioned that how we really need to kind of help the people of Indian illegally occupied Jammu and Kashmir. What's your take on that and how do you think that, you know, while Pakistan is championing this cause, how do the people back home in Indian Ill illegally occupied Jammu and Kashmir feel? I think it's very important um, the way uh, the Prime Minister of this setup, how he uh, quite confidently and vocally addressed the core issue of Kashmir and uh, because Pakistan is a legitimate party to this dispute, there are over a dozen UN resolutions and uh, uh, what he expressed was ac exactly the same sentiment of the Kashmiri people and of every, I think, human being on this planet, the right to self-determination, mm -hmm. which is pivotal for any human being and that right to exist, the right to identity and uh, the way he expressed everything, that is the truth, you know, it's not just that Pakistan is party to this dispute, but uh, it's about humanity, it's about the genocide being committed by mm. the Indian uh, state and now the transnational uh, terrorism that's spreading all over the world mm. and uh, it's the impact of uh, um, the state patronage of uh, extremism and fascism is, is, is something which is, uh, you know, having a very high mm. uh, security cost for human beings around the world mm. uh, if they are uh, in any way challenging uh, this fascist regime, they are being targeted, not just within India or Indian illegally occupied Jammu True. and Kashmir. It is not just that one Sikh leader is uh, was murdered, but many others, there are incidents we have seen in the past of harassment, of threats, of attacks. And uh, the world uh, needs to, you know, wake up. Pakistan has been screaming from time and again that, you know, we want peace in the region, we want a peaceful settlement, otherwise the whole world will be jeopardized. Exactly. And uh, Ms. Mishal, we've seen that uh, uh, India is constantly, and uh, after uh, to 2019, the abrogation of the Article 370, that India has been trying to change the identity uh, of the Kashmiri people, right? They have banned the Faran, they have banned the languages there, there's a digital apartheid there, there's no internet out there, the entire leadership has been jailed, um, and there has been Governor Raj that has been imposed, mm -hmm. right? So uh, these atrocities were taking place, but the ferocity and the momentum of the atrocities have increased a lot, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, so, yes, how do you think we need 
need to respond and considering the fact that you've alluded to the fact that one uh, Sikh leader dies in Canada and there's a, such a momentum, how do you think we can learn from their movement and make sure that we spark more momentum into the Kashmir peoples because obviously they've been suffering for such a long, long time and this suffering should come to an end in the yes, first place. Yes, I, I agree with you. I mean, it's, it's not just a um, blatant violation of, uh, you know, when it comes to Kashmir, what happened mm -hmm. on 5th of August 2019 how Article 370, 35A was abrogated. This was uh, a blatant violation of the four Geneva Conventions, but also yes. of Article 2 uh, of the UN Charter and also of uh, you know um, Article 6, Six, that they are jeopardizing uh, peace and mm. uh, they are a threat to global and regional peace. So they have no mandate legitimacy to be True. a non-permanent member of the United Nations or to be um, you know representing uh, human rights or um, on any international national platform and, and they should be an expulsion mm -hmm. of the UN uh, membership of uh, India and uh, I think there should be a stop, a full stop to it the way nobody is actually, uh, the world is condemning. We've seen two strong uh, UN Human Rights Commission reports, one in 2018, True. one in 2019, uh, but uh, surprisingly uh, the UN Human Rights Commission uh, was uh, not allowed access uh, and it's only distant reporting mm -hmm. that took place or through mm -hmm. visuals or through some kind of you know um, information coming from the Kashmiris but on the whole we've seen in the past also in 2020 and in the recent like Amnesty International they then sent a collective letter mm -hmm. uh, to G20 countries uh, addressing the human rights situation the grave right. situation there and access to international rapporteurs and you know fact-finding missions mm -hmm. but uh, India has been non-compliant to all of this mm -hmm. exactly and in addition to that you know we would certainly want to kind of highlight you know how you made sure that you're going to champion the cause too because imagine obviously it's going to be a lot of pressure and I would certainly want you to kind of answer this that you know how do you or how anybody would handle this pressure because it should always be taken as a reference point that the misery is to, to an extent where a wife cannot meet her husband you mm -hmm. know a daughter cannot meet her father mm -hmm. and it, it's not done so imagine now that, that you happen to be the special advisor to the Prime Minister on Human Rights and Women Empowerment is it more pressure, number one? Number two, you know, when we come down to how, you know, you raised your concerns and voice and made sure that, you know, that the world really needs to hear that India cannot be a part of the G20 summit because you were addressing a rally, you know, the people in a larger number out there and you're making sure that, you know, every lacuna that that might be out there, which exists still, you know, you're making sure that you're going to kind of take on and take it head on. Um, I don't know when you're personally suffering from something, uh, I think you realize the pain of uh, victims and, and when the goal is common and you're also leading it and you're also a victim mm -hmm. and you're suffering and uh, the personal heavy toll it takes on you and the emotional cost mm -hmm. along with the mental health issues that the mental uh, you know uh, stresses that we go through uh, post-traumatic stress disorder this is what something every True. Kashmiri can relate to no matter how strong we are so all these things compile together and then uh, you know um, advocating for our rights mm -hmm. i think it gives us uh, not just uh, an immense power to stand up against mm -hmm. tyranny and against the highest occupation of the world uh, and combating them in a defenseless and unarmed manner but i don't know s personally um, i think um, the one place where i get a little vulnerable is uh, honestly speaking is that how to you know actually convince my daughter that you know it's been over nine years and uh, um, she's deprived of even hugging her father or even speaking to him on the phone so I mean this is something which really makes me you know uh, very uh, weak emotionally that you know I, I, I wish this had not happened I you know for adults it's different but not for a child True. They stealing their childhood and a child dreaming every day mm -hmm. to meet her father, to speak to him, to send him letters and she's compiled so many cards and you know, the bond between a father and a daughter. I, I can't really, um, you know, articulate it in the right uh, form of words right now. But yes, it's, it's, it's an um, unending journey and a long wait. But at the same time, I'm teaching her to stand up for the children of Kashmir and she herself is a very, you know, passionate and she has that rebel spirit of Yasin and me and um, she has been uh, you know speaking up for her father and for other Kashmiri political prisoners and for other children as well of conflict and of Kashmir.
can't go to school. And then you raising your voice obviously yeah. against India where you know they are a part of the G20 summit and making yes. sure that the world's going to come together and True. we do see that the world's not responding in a manner that they should you know so as now so, as the um, you know uh, special <laughs> advisor to the Prime Minister on Human Rights and Women Empowerment how do you make sure that on a governmental level that the voice reaches out to the rest of the world. Yes, I think I have more reach now to you know get in contact with international human rights organizations, and um, um, it's uh, it's easier the access, but at the same time the responsibility is very heavy because mm -hmm. I'm not just you know um, um, uh, SAPM for mm -hmm. the people of Kashmir; it's also for Pakistan. So people so have very high hopes because since we are the forefront of uh, the worst hum uh, human rights violations taking place and speaking up for them in Kashmir. So their expectations are skyrocketing mm. and they expect miracles and it's an interim setup. Mm. But I keep assuring them that, you know, I'm going to stand up for the minorities and for any issue anywhere. I'm there and that's how I started my journey as this, uh, after taking uh, this um, portfolio, accepting it. I went to the jails over here because jails are very close to the heart of Kashmiris because mm. our life is a jail. And I wanted to see the situation of prisoners, so I, I went to Adyala well, yeah, jail. Prayer rooms, everything. Yes, I, I, I visited, and it was a surprise visit because I wanted to see uh, the condition of the prisoners. And because I've been visiting, visiting a lot of jails in Indian illegally occupied Jammu and Kashmir, and uh, comparing the situation and, and the legal access people getting through Laja and other facilities being provided to them, are they being produced physically? Mm -hmm. And then the juveniles, um, most of them are beggars, so we're thinking of forming a rehab center for them because that's not the place for children. Mm -hmm. So on the, on the whole, the situation was good uh, because uh, the food, the nutrition, uh, the hygiene was good. I was, um, um, I was uh, happy with the, with on that front. But at the same time, uh, I think um, easy access to justice and, uh, um, and family contact, these things are essential for any prisoner. And I was happy to see that um, you know, the prisoners were allowed to meet their families. I'm not talking about high profile prisoners, I'm talking about normal. And so you know, many prayers go out for you and, and it's because of the fact that imagine that you, you know, because you felt it yourself and you know that you've been a victim to it mm -hmm. yourself and that you, you went out there to see whether what the condition, what's the condition and people and are living and whether they right. are connected with their family right. members or not. And, and it truly, um, you know, a personal, but there's a personal, personal touch to that tragedy, obviously, because you yourself are uh, suffering from that. But uh, now let's analyze the situation of Indian illegally occupied Jammu and Kashmir and we've how the entire Gupta group, uh, which has been party uh, with the Indian government, central government there, and they have been doing politics on the dead bodies of the Kashmir. And now when they have been deprived of their, uh, what do you call the governorship, so now they're uh, crying foul of the entire system there, mm -hmm. right? And we've seen that how Korean leaders have been jailed and obviously your husband is uh, struggling there for such a long time and that too on the all doled up charges, right? So when the entire leadership in the, the jail, how do you see the resistance movement in the Kashmir turning out? Because we've seen that how even women are coming out and protesting against the India and we've seen the very indigenous methods that they're employing. Madam. Yes, um, uh, it's, it's very difficult but it's part of the Kashmiri DNA resistance. They, they stand up. But yes, it's it's very rare to have such you know uh, immensely strong leadership yes. uh, that we are blessed with. But at the same time, all the leadership is uh, behind bars on uh, concocted charges and fabricated cases, uh, and without any legal access and languishing in death cells and barracks in various jails of India. Mm -hmm. uh, but the sentiment is so deep rooted and. Uh, it is so indigenous that it just simply cannot die down. Mm -hmm. And we're seeing that now it's being transferred into uh, the youngsters, mm, students in colleges and schools that they're leading it. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's a tragedy that India is focusing on, you know, making the entire leadership, uh, the movement leaderless, because their main goal is that, you know, it should be, a, it should be sold to the world as a scattered mob and they can, you know, right. head towards God forbid terrorism. But it's, it's something which is legitimate. It is our land mm -hmm. we are leading this movement and uh, the world has recognized and it's india mm -hmm. which is violating not just the un security council resolutions mm -hmm. the geneva conventions international laws 
humanitarian laws and you know committing the worst crime in the world which is genocide right. it's a it's something which is uh, impossible in such an environment leading a democratic struggle which uh, for the right to self determination which is the supreme right of any right. human right. on this planet right. and that right uh, for that right it's going to continue till you know we finally reach our yeah. but 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 at the same time the circumstances are impossible mm -hmm. humanly it's like you know the resistance the spirit is there but for how long can we mm -hmm. as human beings without any defense system combat this uh, mega occupation which is like you know like a bloodthirsty yeah, dracula which is, is you know thriving to just you know transform this into entire graveyard and then just you know uh, construct buildings and you know apartments and uh, God temples. knows what yes. and temples. Yes, yes. they have uh, demolished so many uh, right. mosques and uh, in and fact uh, changing the identity yes. there. But Madam, we've seen that how um, the human rights movement or if we couch the social movement into the mm. words of human rights, uh, it does gain a momentum because the human rights uh, is the language of the global body out there. And uh, since you also there, you are resisting and you are also championing the cause of there. So how do you think that we can make that movement more effective by couching it into the language of human rights? Uh, because this is the language that resonates with the global body. And we've also seen that the right to self-determination, which is a fundamental human right, uh, it's, uh, I mean, very closely integrated into the United Nations resolutions out there. But uh, India, like you mentioned, um, is very cleverly attaching it with the terrorism. And India is also signatory to the Astana Convention, which very clearly states that the right to self-determination can never be overlapped with the terrorism in the first place. So as a minister, how can you make this point more pertinent out there to the world? Yeah. Yes, I think it is basically we have to look at it from the legal perspective, yes. from the perspective of uh, universal um, jurisdictions mm -hmm. and uh, international law. Mm -hmm. And from that spectrum, I think our focus, the way you mentioned that India is a signatory to many conventions, yes. international uh, treaties mm -hmm. and uh, um, uh, it is something which is uh, where they are blatantly violating, especially when it comes to uh, the people of Kashmir, how they are uh, violating international covenants on mm. the rights of prisoners, on uh, on various covenants on uh, disappearances, torture, and uh, political and civil liberties. So uh, definitely, if we go from that perspective, we can take this case to the international a criminal court to international court of justice we have seen in the past uh, that uh, the un human rights commission established uh, you know ad hoc uh, international criminal tribunals in the case of rwanda and yugoslavia on war crimes and why can't we you know uh, get um, uh, these uh, kind of uh, criminal tribunals established by the U UN uh, on these war crimes and now the global terrorism is like you know it's global terrorism mm. being promoted from India and uh, RSS should not be taken as lightly because they already have this mega you know trained uh, forces which is a parallel Indian army and uh, they have been involved in you know um, creating God forbid uh, um, atomic bombs and they are working on that and if they have that in their control then what will happen but luckily for luck sorry unluckily uh, the Indian Prime Minister is also a diehard RSS follower and True. he has the nuclear commands of India mm -hmm. and we witnessed on 27th of uh, February 2019 how nuclear codes were exchanged between India and Pakistan just to win Indian elections exactly and this Dracula in, in, in days to come we believe is going to ask for more blood unfortunately True. and this really needs to stop that the world needs to come together because it just does not end over here so imagine mm -hmm. that when we talk about gender based violence imagine that when we talk about you know taking dis i mean taking advantage of the state powers you know making sure that you're going to harass people every single day that you're going to increase the number of occupation forces that you're going to change the demographics so what's the point of all of these international treaties and why do we see that the world has blindfolded themselves and not talking about you know the plight of the indian or the people of the indian illegally occupied jammu and kashmir and this is something which the world needs to come together and we share this on this platform number one obviously as pakistanis there are brethren you know so there's no way there's no single day that we're not thinking about them or praying about them number two i believe that you know that this is the right platform we got in 47 to 50 countries we really want people to make sure that you, as you take to social media, why don't, why can't we post for a for a cause? And today we gather for a cause, and the cause is that you know that we kind of contribute towards the right to self determination. So how do you see them using you know state power 
to harass, gender-based violence, you know, taking away yeah. their constitutional rights, even if there's any constitution which exists, because unfortunately, when the since the occupation forces have been there, they, they're still fighting for this right to self-determination. I don't know. I just fail to understand that what actually, you know, frightens the world or influences the world when we're living in a world of geopolitics and geoeconomics, uh, and especially when you have a terrorist mindset regime in India promoting all sorts of violence, how they're targeting minorities. Look what's happening in Manipur, the Manipur violence, and then True. the Gujarat killings, mm. and the anti-minority bills, uh, the targeting of the Sikhs and the farmers' movement, and s and especially the Kashmiri. That's like, you know, and <laughs> complete every open, single day, even open in genocide India. and forced conversions yes. uh, taking place, and absolutely no religious freedom, and uh, being targeted on the basis of uh, caste, color, creed, and ethnicity. And um, there's no stop to it. And we've seen that this targeting of minorities has gone global with India. So I think the world True. needs to realize that if they are not accepting the Hindu Tua people are not accepting moderate Hindus, Dalits, they're not accepting Sikhs living there, or Muslims, or uh, Christians, or people of other faiths, and uh, especially the Kashmiris, then how would they accept uh, foreign multinationals, mm. foreigners to live there in peace in the long term? And I don't even see it as long term. I think in, a, in the next few years, um, uh, foreigners would feel very, very unsafe there because there is a complete unacceptability True. for anyone else True. who raises a voice against Hindutva. So I think that's where the world needs to focus. And all those countries that were there during the G20 summit in Delhi, um, none of the international human rights organizations were given access in any of the pressers. True. True. And uh, we witnessed no joint uh, presser between uh, Joe Biden and uh, uh, Mr. Modi, because of the human rights situation, the Manipur violence, what's happening in Kashmir. So I think it was just a drama. And then secondly, um, the Russian and the Chinese head of the state was not there. And mm. a very, you know, it's just a complete lip service what took place on Ukraine and Russia. And I think it was just to get a headline that they, they, they drafted uh, uh, a declaration the yes. otherwise there was nothing substantial except for a propaganda and uh, but at the same time or oh, i i would address all the um, international world that's interested in investing in india that it's almost impossible uh, to find any you know results unless and until we do not work for lasting peace mm -hmm. and the biggest problem towards peace is uh, the you know the issue of kashmir unless yes. and until it's not resolved then it's entire region is like you know i i would say the globe the way india has a state True. machinery of terrorism and disinfo lab case we witnessed in the past True. or uh, so many hundreds of ingos that were selling a false narrative to the world and uh, uh, and they were caught so i think uh, rss disinfo lab targeting minorities all over the world they have this entire racket mm. uh, of uh, not just uh, harassing but also intimidating their families living within india and kashmir and they've done that in the past mm. with kashmiris and i get a lot of complaints in the past as well that when kashmiris are leading some protest uh, in uk europe or in australia america and other places uh, the indian high commission threatens them that you know That's we are going to target your families living and it in is the of and it is of utmost importance that we see the resolution of the uh, Kashmir issue because it is indispensable for the uh, regional peace as well and not just regional peace I think at a bigger stake when we talk about the people of Indian illegally occupied Jammu and Kashmir and unfortunately that we have to share such sad visuals with, with, with our audiences out there but this is the reality you know we have seen that happening to kids uh, not just kids you know to the elderly you know where and kids are actually, actually taken away of their the right to uh, for for education you know and not they, how those they have been rights. maimed see the pellet bullets they have been using it to make sure that they are blinded um, and obviously how we've seen that uh, these are used to maim the population and to control the uh, population out there, to pol control the political bodies out there. And we've also seen that how uh, kids are resisting the Indian occupation. And we've also seen that how Razia Sultana, she spoke at length about how uh, she misses her father. And obviously, she's an advocate of all of the children who are living in uh, Indian illegally occupied Jammu and Kashmir, who are deprived of their parents, who are deprived of their healthy uh, childhood. Because every child has a right to have uh, the healthy child. Childhood, and every now, child out there, uh, Hajra, is, is, is uh, Razia Sultana, you know, because course. every single day they wake up, they make sure that they're going to continue this fight for, you know, their right to self-determination. And this is something which we want the world to realize. And, and 
in a, such a young age, if a child realizes that, I think that should scare any uh, body which is harassing the kids out there. But now and it tarnishes to, your childhood. Of course, of course, and there's lots of trauma that is attached with it. But now coming to you, madam, we've seen that how the whenever the people are protesting, the Kashmiri diaspora is protesting in the UK, we've seen that uh, they come out in millions and it's such a huge protest. It's not just in London, Brussels, uh, I mean, Washington, DC. They're all in very mm. influential capitals across the world. So as a minister how can you make sure that you incorporate their momentum into the Kashmiri lobbying for out there because um, obviously they're very powerful and they have an influence out there and they can be utilized as a tool for making sure that our outreach to Kashmiri people our brethren out there who are suffering can be made more powerful in the first place just like how Palestinian people are protesting and how their voice is getting more momentum in the Western capitals yes it's very important that we mobilize our Kashmiri diaspora and they're already very active and mm. I'm in touch with all of them and after assuming charge as a SAPM I think uh, we're working on we very closely with a lot of international activists also uh, especially on Kashmir we are planning a hundred day plan mm -hmm. from this ministry and in that short term goals three three month goals that how can we internationalize the Kashmir issue how can we take it forward and at the same time um, you know a long term plan mm. for uh, you mm. know um, promoting the cause of peace and the heavy human and economic costs attached with this pending conflict of Kashmir. There was a report by the World Bank in um, 2018, it was um, half class full uh, and um, they mentioned that at that time there was almost like 2 billion trade and could go on to 37 billion trade dollars between India and Pakistan if this issue is resolved. It's a nuclear flashpoint and it's humanity mm -hmm. and already we have suffered a lot. Our entire leadership is being punished. Mm -hmm. uh, we lost Saeed Ali Ghilani Sahab and uh, how he was buried, uh, the world knows. True. Nobody can go to his grave uh, to pay their last respects and uh, Ashraf Sarai Sahab, uh, Riyat leader was poisoned. Right. Uh, S.A.R. Gilani Sahab professor was also poisoned, uh, who was a very famous professor uh, teaching yes. at Jawaharlal Nehru University because his only crime was that he was very active on promoting a peaceful solution. So I think we need to, you know, um, work very actively and at war footing mm -hmm. and especially the pace at which India is moving forward in changing the demography and we've already witnessed 50 lakh Indians have been issued domicile certificates. Exactly. Yes. And now they have the right to buy property over there yes. and, and we've spoken about it in our introduction as well. And you know, while we kind of always make sure that we come together as Pakistanis and we kind of harking to the rest of the world as well that everybody needs to come and kind of contribute to this cause, see, uh, we do see that you know how you have a bigger responsibility, Alhamdulillah. You've always been uh, a, a person where with, with a lot of uh, burden on your shoulder, you know, why, when we speak of the, the Hurriyat leader himself uh, and you happen to be his wife and you know you've been not been given the right to go see your husband, now you have the responsibility of the woman over here as well and not just that you know the human rights violation which take place over here so at large how do you see fulfilling your tenure as the uh, special advisor to the prime minister on human rights and women empowerment that things actually kind of start to change and change in a manner where they are sustainable and inshallah in days to come we would certainly want you to be out there making sure that they, you are going to contribute to the cause. Yes, I think there's a heavy burden on my shoulders because of the expectations, because of the Kashmir struggle. Uh, yes, I'm very passionate about women empowerment and I believe that uh, especially women who are already empowered, they have a heavy responsibility on them uh, to empower women of villages, underprivileged women um, in the rural areas because that's where the problem lies. That's where, you know, I mean, you see in cities there are issues of harassment and other issues, but at least they can be recorded. But when we go to villages, mm -hmm. their hygiene, their health conditions and uh, um, the heavy economic cost attached with uh, the you know unpaid labor of, of uh, Pakistani women in villages uh, they're, they're a major source of income in the agricultural economy of Pakistan uh, so we need to promote them we need to highlight their issues we need to give them that strength and at the same time I'm very passionate that women of Pakistan uh, there should be an increase in the quota 
uh, of their representation in, in, in elections, not just on reserve seats, that they should be empowered, that every party should make sure that, you know, a certain percentage of women should be given the tickets to, and, and to go in mainstream politics. Thank you so much for saying that because, you know, that there's been a longer debate on that and uh, we certainly do not uh, have time for that. But don't you think that rather than having a quota, it, it would be best that they kind of uh, contest in the constituency election and yes, you know, I'm, I, yes, yes, I'm talking about that. I'm talking about in elections, not yes. on the reserve seats, going in uh, constituencies. Okay, so fine. that for that, yes, when so that the, uh, when when leaders. these political parties are distributing their tickets, right. they should empower women more, more, and there should be a set quota of distributing uh, tickets. Exactly. And at the same time, I think it's very important that we should work on uh, awareness and also promoting our own culture and uh, what Islam teaches us. Islam mm -hmm. is an empowered religion which gave, was the first religion to give um, property rights to women That's and uh, right to uh, whom to marry, who to divorce, right of divorce and many other things and I think it's important that we go back to our roots because in this digital world that we are in, mm -hmm. we need to also teach the masses uh, digital literacy That's and true. through that you know, promote uh, national causes, women empowerment and through PTA, PAMRA, we get a, you know, a chunk of free time and that that's where we need to promote. And then we have uh, this Zara app, uh, which promotes uh, what happened with, yes, it's, it's very, uh, it's, it's doing really well. But the problem is that it is not being projected the way it should. So in this short time, we're going to be focusing more on marketing, projecting all the policies that have been done by the past regimes and and I believe that we should appreciate all the good exactly. things that are being done mm -hmm. and we should take them forward and um, work for and one interest. last thing how how do you think that for all of those people who are watching you right now can reach out to you because we do see that you know that when people have these leadership roles a lot of people want to yes. reach out to them and we've always seen you that you've always been available not just for the people of Indian illegally occupied Jammu and Kashmir but for Pakistani women, men, everybody. You've always been out there. Right. How do you think that they can reach out to you? Is there any portal? Any yes. contact information, please go ahead. We're, we are establishing that very soon, within a week, inshallah. Uh, we're working on our 100-day plan and that this is very important because I like being with people. Mm. And in, even in my office in PMO, it's like all the time delegations are coming. It's, very, form policy. it's very formal and, you know, the room gets crowded, but I like the crowd. I, and, and whoever comes, I tell them, speak your heart out, okay. you know. We, we need to, you know, you need to feel comfortable. So the kind of stories they share with me, their personal issues, and especially, I'm very, you know, um, emotionally attached with the minorities of Pakistan because they're like, you know, they're the beauty of Pakistan. And I, I was, yesterday I was there at uh, Jarawala. I, w I visited uh, the, uh, the, Church. uh, the churches yes. and um, I'm, I'm very happy that, you know, uh, there is like everybody from, not just from the state, but the public at large, all over the country have been coming out with interfaith uh, rallies in, in promoting the rights of the Christians mm. of uh, of the Sikhs. And then I went to the Gurdwara in um, Nankana Sahab uh, to pay my respects and also uh, to, uh, and you know, to express it, solidarity yeah. with my uh, Sikh uh, brothers and sisters or what to, uh, what happened in, in, in Canada. And yeah. we stand with them, not just the government, but also the people of Indian illegally occupied Jammu mm. and Kashmir. So um, it's, it's something which I'm very passionate about, interfaith harmony and religious freedom and, and I'm very happy that you know we, we, we see a very you know a civilized Pakistan where right. we respect one another and if and there were foreign involvements in this uh, yeah. issue of attack on churches so they w India wanted to you know um, kind of distract from their Manipur violence and the G20 summit so this kind of false flag operations do take place but the society at large the state everybody the state machinery everybody was active and uh, Alhamdulillah, by the 25th of September, um, people will be going back to their homes. They're being rehabbed. And uh, 2020 lakhs uh, have been given to almost 94 families in this short interim setup. So I think I'm pretty Wonderful. happy yes. by the response of the government, the mm -hmm. Chief Justice, and also the civil society. And, uh, we, and for one month, uh, we will... Uh, not be charging any fee in public and private uh, for uh, you know Christian brothers and sisters. Wonderful. Mashallah. And we want to wish you best of luck as well. Uh, you know a lot of praise your way, not mm. just from our side. I think from the entire country. True. You know Thank the entire you. country harkens for you, and we certainly want you and people like you to be in such positions who actually not in the first place are looking for a leadership role, but rather feel the pain of the people. And we are glad that you've done so much in such short a span of time. And we True. kind of pray that you don't have to look at it. I mean, for everybody who's out there. 
ladies and gentlemen, I think it, this is it for today. But please make sure that if any single day you get this feeling or you get this thought in your mind that, okay, what have I done for the people of Indian illegally occupied Jammu and Kashmir and the people of my country, please make sure that that is the day that you do something. Until next time, look after yourself. It's a good morning.